you were to ask me what I think is the most dangerous malaise we have in our society today, I would say without hesitation that it's the lack of the sense of duty among so many people in our society. There was a time when people understood their duty, their obligation to one another, to the world at large, the greatest generation, the people who lived through the Second World War, certainly knew that very well. They knew that life was not about them. They knew how to sacrifice, how to give of themselves and go without for the benefit of a greater cause, that they were part of something bigger than themselves. And so from the simple things of going without nylons and chocolate and uh, blackout evenings, and even to the point of soldiers being willing to give their life for a greater cause, they knew that they were something, uh, part of something bigger than themselves. Unfortunately today, many people have lost that. And we find today a lot of people who have, do not have a, great, a sense of duty, but rather a sense of entitlement, that they deserve things. And anything they want is their right. In fact, it becomes anything they desire, they start trying to declare as their civil right. And somebody better pass a law and give it to them so that they can have whatever they're looking for. And of course, in doing that, they demand that other people meet their needs. And the more they're centered on themselves, the less they are meeting the needs of others. And when somebody disagrees with them and says, no, that is not your right, you can't have that, they get nasty, they get mean, even violent. And that's what's causing so much of the strife in our world today, the unrest. People who are living as if everything depends upon them, and all the world is supposed to give them what they're looking for. And of course, the more we see that, the more people looking for me, the less people le uh, reaching out to other people, and the worse the world gets. And it's not just in the world at large, it even hits us in the household of the faith. Just last week, I was reading a report that came out from the Archdiocese of Philadelphia, where with the Synod and everything that's been going on, the Synod on Synods and all of that, they uh, had a synod specifically of the college students and all the Catholic universities in Pennsylvania. And they published the results that these young people found. 18 pages of the results from the young people. And everything they had in there was all about entitlement. It was about, we want the church to listen to us. We want the leaders to hear our needs. We want women priests. We want all these other things. And they use repeatedly the word, we want the church to be accepting, which is a nice word in itself, who doesn't want to be accepting? But what they mean by accepting is that they want the church to change the teachings of God so that things that people want to do that the Lord has said are sinful, in fact, they want the church to change the teachings and make them blessed and bless them so that people will be able to do what they want to do. And of course, that completely overrides or is the antithesis of everything in the gospel. In fact, if you look at uh, original sin, that's precisely what original sin was. Adam and Eve were tempted by the devil uh, because de the Lord told them, do not eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil or even touch it or you will die. And that's a beautifully poetic way of saying, don't try to decide for yourself what's right and wrong. I am God, you are not. I cannot be wrong. You can. You can be misled. You can be deceived. I cannot. Just because your mind thinks it and your heart feels it doesn't mean it's right. Listen to me and do what I tell you and everything will be fine. But Adam and Eve did not listen to God. They went after the devil's temptation to decide for themselves what's right and wrong. And they brought original sin into the world. And then oh, they committed original sin. And then all the evils that we know, they opened the path for Satan to destroy our world. And that's what he's been doing ever since. And that's what we've been suffering from. People looking for their own needs, what they think and what they feel, rather than what God reveals. And the Lord Jesus God himself took on flesh and dwelt in our world to you know, destroy the power of death, to restore to us what was lost, but then taught us to follow his teaching. Listen to me so that you can correct all of these wrongs, all of the things that people are doing. Don't listen to your own mind and your own heart. Follow me. And if you do that, everything will be correct again. But sadly, as we saw epitomized in that statement by the young people, 
It was all about my decisions, my plans, my ideas, what I want, and they want the church to change and conform with society, to get in with other people, to give them what they want. And if we were to do that, as some people demand that we do, well, the church has to get with it. I've even heard some people saying, you know, somebody recently who told me they're planning to become Catholic, and somebody said, oh, how could you possibly join that church? I want to join a church that's more accepting of people. Well, if we were to do what they tell us to do, we'd only be feeding the problem, the very thing that's causing all the difficulty in the first place, people deciding for themselves what's right and wrong rather than listening to God. And in all of those 18 pages of the young people there, there was not one single mention there of discipleship of Jesus, following the Lord, growing in holiness, the call to heaven, the call to sanctity, changing the world. All of that was blatantly missing. Everything that's the, at the heart of what Christ is teaching. And no wonder we're not in step with the world. And surely the church is different from the world around us. Our message is completely opposite to what the world wants to hear. And yet some people, as I said, want us to change the church's message to get in step with the world. But then again, we'd be losing our whole identity as the ones preaching the message of Jesus that is meant to save us from the errors of the world. And if we did that, we'd just be going along causing more of the problem. And we're the ones who are sent by the Lord as his church to be the ones who teach the world a different message. No, follow the Lord. He showed us the way to truth. You and I in our hearts don't know it. Christ does. Listen to him. And we have a duty to follow him. But unfortunately today, as those young people showed and so many people in the world, they want a world that's a church that's accepting, that goes out and accepts people rather than challenges people. When did Jesus ever say in the scriptures, go out and be accepting? No, he said quite the opposite. His call to us was a, was a call for a radical change at the very heart of our being to completely abandon everything you and I think is going to lead to holiness and lead to what God says is going to lead us to salvation because he is the way, the truth, and the life. And so it means a radical change for us, and the church must, by its very essence and by our vocation, be uh, very different from the world around us and be a, sometimes even a thorn in the side of the world to remind them, you've got it wrong, God has it right. Follow the Lord, and that's where we will see the changes that we need. It was a big thing some years back well, while companies were uh, creating mission statements for what they were all about. Even many parishes were doing that. And sometimes they published them on the front of their Sunday bulletin, and you could read them. And as I've gone to different parishes, I've picked up many things with the uh, mission statement of the parish. And some of them I've looked at and I said, this has absolutely nothing to do with Christ's call to us, with our mandate, with our mission from the Lord. What is our mission statement? We don't need to make a new one. Christ gave it to us. His words to the apostles at his ascension, the last words to them before he went to heaven, full authority has been given to me both in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Baptize them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Teach them to carry out everything I have commanded you and know that I am with you always until the end of time. That is what you and I are about, to remember that Christ has full authority. He sent us out to share the sacraments, to baptize people in Christ, to let people realize that they are immersed in Christ. They have put on Christ. You and I, the day we were baptized, put on Christ. And we're told to go out and be Christ in the world, to continue the work that he began 2,000 years ago, and his call to people to challenge, to change their ways, and do things as God tells us to do it, not as we would want it to be done and to teach them to carry out everything I have commanded you. Commanded. That is an important word. I always teach the children uh, when I'm teaching school that when Moses went up the mountain, God didn't give him the ten suggestions. He gave them the ten commandments that we are obliged to follow. It is our duty to follow them. And in doing that will lead us to salvation. Because as we hear in the preface of every Mass, the, the prayer before we get into the Holy Holy and the consecration, we say, it is our duty 
and our salvation, always and everywhere, to give you thanks, O Lord. So in performing our duty is our salvation because the Lord has willed it to be that way, that by following him and doing what he teaches us to do and teaching others to do the same, that's how you and I will be saved and that's how we change the world. So indeed, no, we are not about entitlement. We are not here to tell God what we want and to try to force God to do things our way. Rather, we're here to ask God and say, Lord, teach me what you want me to do. What is your will? And give me the strength to carry it out. I think sometimes we've completely reversed the roles, as was so epitomized in that statement by the young people, trying to tell God what we want and that God's got to give us what we want ultimate sense of entitlement, ultimate sense of selfishness, that God is here to give me, or God's supposed to give me what I want. And no wonder more and more people are leaving the church because the more that people get into this idea of entitlement, of what's in it for me, of making other people meet my needs, and they look for a church that's going to do that, well, we're not going to do that because that's not what Christ called us to do. He did not call us to go out and entitle people. He called us to go out and challenge them, to reform, to completely change their very way of thinking from the depths of their being. And a lot of people don't want to hear that, and so they leave the church. And when that happens, it's not the church that is out of step with the world, it's the world that's out of step with God. And it is not our place to change and to uh, accept and affirm people in their errors, but rather to be all the more the voice calling people to change and say, no, you've got it wrong. It's not about entitlement. It's not about what the world can do for me, but rather what I can do for the world. And Jesus tells us in the gospel today his wonderful words about duty, uh, talking about that servant coming in, and he says, when you have done everything that has been commanded of you, notice again that word commanded, he says, then say, don't say, look at me, how proud you must be of me, how wonderful I am because I've done everything God told me to do. No, say, we are useless servants. We have done only what we are obliged to do. And you and I do have duties. We have obligations in many places. And that's a message that the world today doesn't want to hear. But in fact, it is the truth. We have an obligation. We have a duty, first of all, to our nation, to our country. We have the duty, to, our duty to obey the laws, to pay our taxes, and do everything that, is proper, that proper citizenship requires of us. We have a duty, an obligation to society, to people around us, to be the best person I can be, to make sure I am morally fit and morally upright, doing things the right way, according to what human beings are called to be, so that I'm not doing things that are wrong to myself that ultimately will affect and harm other people. As sadly we see happening in so much of the pain, so much of the sorrows we read about in the uh, newspapers every day is being caused by people who who are not morally upright, who are not trying to be the best they can be, but who are harming other people by their selfish attitudes. We have a duty to the church. We have a duty certainly to follow everything the church teaches us, to follow all of the commandments, all of the rituals, and all of the things that the church says is our duty, as well as to support the church with our time and talent to the best of our ability. And we have a, a duty to our families, to take care of them. Parents naturally know that with their children, but most especially where it seems to be most lacking is with grown children who have elderly parents who do not take care of their parents' needs. And when parents have grown old and now need the support of their children, it is the duty of their children. It is their obligation, as the fourth commandment says, remember your father and mother, you know, respect your mother, your father and mother, that it will be well, that'll go well for you in life. It is our duty and our obligation to take care of them. And we should never find ourselves feeling proud of ourselves. Look at me, I take care of my parents. That's what we're supposed to do. But sadly, we see so many cases of grown children whose parents are left alone simply because the children find it's inconvenient for them to call their parents, to take care of their needs. And they worry more about their own things, and now that their parents can't do anything more for them, well, they just dismiss them. No, we have an obligation to our parents to take care of them in their old age. And most importantly, 
we have an obligation and a duty before God. Number one, our duty to worship him faithfully. And it may sound like I'm preaching to the choir because here we are. You are here worshiping God faithfully on Sunday. But sometimes some of us are not faithful with that. We don't come every Sunday. We come most Sundays when the kids don't have a football game or something like that, when we're not too tired. And we'll make it when we can make it rather than faithfully worshiping the Lord every Sunday unless there's a bona fide emergency as the Lord commands of us Okay, in the third commandment. But then to follow everything he teaches us, knowing that when we follow what the Lord is teaching us, he's not subjecting us under his power, but rather he's sharing his power with us. My friends, think of that. The Lord is not giving us all these laws to subject us so that he can control us, but rather he's showing us how to make this human being the best it can be, to maximize our potential, to be what he created us to be that has been destroyed by original sin. And when we follow the Lord, it's like doing everything necessary to make a car run to the best of its ability that it purrs like a kitten. Same thing with us. When we follow everything that the Lord tells us to do, our lives will purr like a kitten. Everything will run smoothly. And we discover that God is actually, by his laws and his commands to us, calling us to share in his power, helping us to be the people created in his image and likeness so that by our lives he can work through us he's calling us into be absolute union with him to be one with him and share his power as god my friends that is awesome awesome the fact that god is calling us to union with him and all we have to do to find that is obey his commandments and in that we find our salvation because that leads us to union with christ which is what going to heaven is all about and anybody who has spent time helping other people knows what a difference it is. Think about it. A time maybe you have sacrificed to serve somebody else. Maybe they needed your help one day. They had a chore they couldn't do on their own. And you sacrificed time to be there with them. And afterwards they said to you, thank you. I couldn't have done without you. Don't you feel better? Don't you feel good about yourself? That's a far greater feeling than somebody rose up and met my needs, but rather meeting the needs of other people. Today is Respect Life Sunday, where we reflect upon the sanctity and dignity of every human life. And it is our duty to respect life, reminding people that our job as human beings is to be concerned about one another and help other people have the life that God has created them to be. Jesus says at one point in the gospel, greater love hath no man than that he lay down his life for a friend. But abortion completely reverses that. It doesn't tell the mother to lay down her life for the child, but rather it leads the mother to say, the child is going to lay down its life for me because I find the child's life inconvenient. Completely reverses the call of the gospel. And not only in respect life for all of its stages, but even in the way we treat other people. When we force other people to try to meet our needs, we become very selfish and completely reverse the call to holiness that Christ has given all of us. But when we realize and understand that we are here with a duty to one another to lay our lives at the service of each other, what a difference that is. That's when you and I are truly what Jesus created us to be. And could you imagine what the world would be like if everyone did that? If everyone followed the life that Jesus has created us to be? What a different world we'd have. So much of the pain and the sorrow and the anguish that we see in the newspapers and experience in our lives would just not be there if people would follow Christ. And you and I as the church are called by our mission statement to go out and be Christ in the world and remind people over and over again to follow the Lord because he has the way to make the world what it's meant to be. And when the world is out of step with the Lord, all the more that it is urgent, it is imperative that we turn up the heat and be even more the voice of Christ reaching out to the world saying, folks, you've got it wrong. It's not about entitlement. It's not about what what people can do for you it's what you can do for others because that's what Christ has called us to do and we must resist every temptation to lay down the gospel and not preach the truth of Christ because people find it inconvenient but rather to go out and teach Christ to all the nations and remind them that we've tried 
When we bring things on our own, when we try to do things our way, when we live a life of entitlement, the world resorts to the violence and the anger and the nastiness that we see each and every day. But when we turn to the Lord, asking him to be his presence in the world, to treat other people the way Christ would treat them, for ourselves to be Christ in the world, then we will bring, be bringing the truth to them. The truth that will bring us the peace for which we long, the peace that everyone in his life wants, the peace that will bring us that salvation, that salvation in Christ that comes from doing our duty before the Lord. We will be understanding the truth that comes from that duty, the truth that indeed will set us free. May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever.